see my colleague, uh, Maurice Turner, in Washington, but I don't see a way of sharing my slides. So, make me a share, share my slides. in your background, I know you're in Washington. Oh, we're waking I, I can just a bit of background. Uh, we uh, began this project way back in 2015. Before it was election cybersecurity, it was cybersecurity broadly writ uh, securing everything connected to the internet. And uh, we have uh, 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 we formed a team in 2015, which includes communication and engineering and public policy and the business school, uh, uh, the law school, uh, and others. So by the beginning of 2016, we had a multidisciplinary team of experts. Ready to work on uh, securing uh, on cybersecurity, uh, securing everything connected to the internet. And then uh, later in 2016, the Democratic National Committee in Washington D.C. was the uh, subject uh, victim of a uh, cyber attack, which uh, uh, gained access to their emails, and uh, which were many of which were then released publicly. Uh, uh, to the uh, uh, great embarrassment uh, uh, and worse of the uh, Democratic National Committee. So at that point, we were uh, uh, asked by the uh, first national and then uh, later uh, uh, the uh, governor's organization of the 50 states to become involved in securing elections, uh, securing both elections and campaigns um, uh, around the United States. And uh, uh, we began by doing uh, a few uh, uh, states, six states at a time, um, closed door uh, expert uh, uh, expert operations, um, and then in 2019, preparing for our presidential election the following year, uh, we were asked to do all 50 U.S. states. Um, and as far as we know, we are aside from the federal government in the United States, we're the only organization uh, doing cybersecurity for election officials, uh, campaign workers, and civic organizations in every single one of the 50 US states. Uh, we're talking about thousands of candidates, thousands of uh, several thousand polling places, um, and of course, many thousands of, uh, uh, of uh, civic organizations uh, across the country. Um, our niche, as it were, is that we've been told by both by the Department of Homeland Security uh, at the, in Washington, D.C., and by the national parties, Democratic and Republican parties, that they can secure the candidates for president, the candidates for the U.S. Congress, both House and Senate, but they are not really organized, um, certainly not in 2020, they were not really organized to go below that um, to, um, to help secure the elections at the thousands and thousands of polling places around the United States, which are uh, uh, subject to different laws, uh, different methods, uh, different times of day of voting, uh, and certainly different locations. Sometimes even within an election district, you'll have different hours, uh, different uh, methods of voting. Um, and so it is a highly, highly complex system. I mean, the good news is that it's so complex that it's very, very difficult for an adversary, uh, foreign or domestic, to, um, uh, to affect an election result. Um, the bad news is that it is so decentralized 
that um, uh, we're relying on people in thousands of locations to help keep the election secure. Here I am back in. This is the uh, only the second international program we've done. Uh, the first one was in Greece, and uh, uh, we uh, focused on Europe, and we also focused, as we will today, on listening uh, to find out uh, uh, not only how you react to what we do, but how it's done here, and how there could be different approaches, because uh, democracies all over the world are threatened by uh, foreign actors, notably Russia and China, seem to be investing the most money in trying to disrupt and discredit uh, the democracy. Um, and uh, so what we do in the United States is say, if we are expert enough to defend against Russia and China, we're probably good enough to defend against uh, anybody else, foreign or domestic. But we're not the best in the world. Uh, and going to Greece was a, a very interesting experience because um, the Estonian government has an annual ranking of the best countries for cybersecurity. And the US was not number one. Number one was Greece. We didn't expect that. So that was my first slide I put up and I said, well, we're here to learn from you. How did you become number one? The United States this year was ranked 21. And someone from the uh, Greek Navy, I think he was the number two in their, in their uh, defense ministry. He said, look at the top five best countries for cybersecurity, Greece, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Estonia, Belgium. They're all small countries. And he said, here in Greece, we all know each other. We talk to each other all the time. So we can coordinate much more easily than you can in the United States where you have so many people in so many places uh, trying to work on the same problem that sometimes just communicating is a problem. And uh, certainly in the United States, we saw that uh, on September 11th of 2001, where a lot of people had information about a possible terrorist attack, but there wasn't enough communication about it uh, among people who were getting the information. So uh, that was one of our big lessons from Greece. The other one, uh, while they're preparing their technology was that uh, the speaker who followed me from the University of Piraeus, he said, archaeologists have just discovered that the first democracy, and we were meeting across from the Acropolis, said the first democracy in the world here in Greece, first elections here in Greece, thousands of years ago, someone tried to hack the election. And what archaeologists have found was, this is a, 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 an election, uh, as, as some of you know, in some of the elections in Greece, in ancient Greece, what you would do is you would mark the candidate's name on a piece of pottery and you would deposit it in a large uh, jar and they're like our election boxes today. And when the voting is over, you reach in, you collect all the pieces of pottery and you count who has how many votes. And what archeologists have discovered was that uh, uh, finding one of these jars of, uh, uh, of electoral votes, they discovered that many of the shards of pottery with the people's names on them were in the same handwriting. So somebody had stuffed the ballot box back in you know, 2000 BC. <laughs> uh, so trying to uh, hack elections is not new. Uh, what's new is uh, the, the technology. Um, uh, you'll be hearing from, uh, in addition to me, you'll be hearing from uh, uh, two of my colleagues, uh, one in Washington, Maurice Turner, who is an expert in uh, uh, what kinds of resources are available for free or uh, a reduced um, uh, at a reduced price um, uh, from uh, the US government, but also from, uh, from Facebook, from Microsoft, from uh, Google and other companies. Um, I also have, this is uh, one of the few times we've been able to travel since March of 2020. So I have some of the handouts, which uh, we uh, actually um, hand out. This is one of the best, it's a one pager from the US Department of Homeland Security. It's not for computer scientists, not for experts, but it's 
for people who are working in election offices and people who are working in campaigns, but also, um, as you'll see, um, uh, I don't have enough for everybody, but we'll show you the link. It's really useful uh, information for all of us on uh, how to secure uh, what you do from, uh, from being hacked, whether it's uh, just if you're preparing uh, 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 email or if you're um, uh, working on a financial uh, transaction, uh, uh, quite simple. The others from uh, our new partner at uh, MIT, uh, Michael Coden, who uh, conducts uh, cybersecurity training for some of the largest corporations in the world uh, and their CEOs. He also does it uh, at Davos at the World Economic Forum. And so I asked him to prepare a one sentence, excuse me, one page, one pager that we can hand out. And so here's Michael's one pager, which is a very simple six point checklist. Again, not for experts, but for everybody. Uh, and it's again, useful for, uh, uh, for everybody. So now, uh, we are ready to begin to uh, share slides. Yes. So I will go to um, right show from the beginning. Um, this is who I am. I'm executive director of the uh, Election Cybersecurity Initiative. And here is really something we keep in mind all the time, which is uh, this is from Steve Simon, the uh, Secretary of State of the State of Minnesota. And this is um, one of his uh, sayings that he says in many of our meetings, that the reality is we're in a race with no finish line. We'll ne we're never going to finish. The best we can do is try to keep up with our adversaries. And then here's something from, uh, 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 from a report uh, on, okay, who's the best at cybersecurity in the world? Yes, we have a list from Estonia, but who's the best? And one of the best is the Ukraine. Why? Because they've been attacked by Russia for so many years and the work they've done to be resilient has really paid off. Uh, and so there are some simple lessons that we have from uh, Ukraine on how to uh, defend against uh, Russian cyber attacks. Here's that uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, shard that I told you about. The gentleman in uh, gray there is uh, uh, the uh, professor from the University of Piraeus who was talking about the attempt to change the uh, election uh, in Greece uh, thousands of years ago. And here's the uh, list of uh, the Estonia's list of uh, the five best countries in cybersecurity this year. And where's the United States? We're number 21. So we have a lot to learn and we have to keep that in mind all the time. Here's the cybersecurity challenge here in Africa. 18 different countries will have elections next year and they're all different. Uh, different national laws, different rules, people trained in different ways um, and uh, uh, please uh, feel free to take pictures if you want, but also uh, uh, I will uh, be uh, leaving a copy of this with the organizers and so uh, perhaps they can um, post this uh, if, uh, uh, if there's interest. Here is the parallel challenge in the United States. We are very decentralized. As I said, we have more than 8,000 election districts around the United States, each with different laws and rules and that last line almost all of our election workers are part-time. Some of them don't even come to do election work until the week of the election. So how do you have all of these people at all these locations prepared for a cyber attack by some very, very smart and very well-financed um, uh, adversaries? Uh, here are just a couple of examples from this month. Here was an October 5th uh, cyber attack. The reason I'm putting this up is because Look at what they're doing. They're attacking a state website, a state election website in the United States. That's where voters get their information. So somebody can attack a state election site and either take it down entirely or even worse, change the information on the state site. That means that voters trying to figure out where, when, and how to vote will have the wrong information. And here is one from a couple of weeks ago. Here's what China is doing, according to the FBI. They are scanning state party headquarters, not the national, they're probably scanning the national one too, but they're going after the state party headquarters around the United States because they know the security is not as good in the state and local offices as they are nationally. So um, they're doing that because that's something which uh, uh, they, uh, 
they can do. Is that Joe? Do I see Joe there? Yes, hi. <laughs> well, uh, uh, with us is uh, Joseph Marks, who for three and a half years uh, wrote a daily column on cybersecurity for the Washington Post. Uh, and uh, he's now based here in Johannesburg. So uh, I feel like uh, he should be up here behind the microphone because he is certainly uh, one of our leading experts in the United States uh, on these issues. Um, and in fact, in one of our workshops, uh, Joe said that the reason that a lot of this goes on is because it's easy to do. And so uh, adversaries are doing it. Now, why are so many campaigns and elections targets? And, uh, and, uh, uh, and Joe, I'm gonna quote you a couple of times here. Uh, one is to disrupt political operations, disrupt the parties, uh, disrupt campaigns, um, but also to collect donor lists. I mean, politics and democracies, you're running on money and uh, different adversaries are going to want, well, who's financing these candidates? Who's financing these elections? And how can we go after them? But also contacts, who are the supporters of each candidate? Um, uh, third line, ransomware. Okay, what if we can take down an entire campaign uh, of uh, a digital operation and then say, uh, or just their donor list and say, you know what, unless you pay us, you're not gonna get your donor list back. There's nothing just going on uh, throughout the world, but in the United States, we're seeing it where school systems are attacked, hospitals are attacked uh, for ransomware. People will come and uh, 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 shut down a hospital computer system, say, my little emergency room you have there, pay us or the emergency room doesn't work. Happening all over the United States and all over the world. Um, intelligence and defense facilities. Um, there was the example of uh, North Dakota, which uh, we talked about uh, in some of our workshops, including our two workshops, three workshops we've done for North Dakota. And um, uh, something which, uh, uh, again, credit where credit's due, uh, uh, Joe Marks made a, a point that, why would Russia go through the trouble of, as the governor of North Dakota told us in a workshop, why would they go through the trouble of attacking a small, rural, low population county in Northern North Dakota? Oh yes, they, they were attacking the school system to try to get into, according to the governor, try to get into the students' laptops and phones. Students take the phones home. Now the Russians can get into their parents' home networks. What do the parents do? Some of them could be involved in elections. Even more important, some of them could be involved in a Minuteman missile base that's right there next to that county. So it's not totally random, but it's very widespread. Um, then identify future leaders. Um, and uh, I forget who used this phrase first, but I know that one of the people who uses it is Joe Marks, which is the lesson of 2004. What's the lesson of 2004 for American politics and for adversaries like Russia, China, and all the other foreign intelligence services around the world? In 2004, there was this little known member of the state legislature in Illinois. And uh, uh, yes, some people in Chicago said, oh, he's, he's a smart guy. Uh, maybe he'll amount to something one day. That was 2004. Just four years later, he's elected president of the United States, Barack Obama. So the lesson of 2004 is, if you are Russia, China, or any other foreign adversary of the United States, and you wanna know who's gonna be in charge in a few years, in eight years, in 10 years, look at the lower level office holders. The head of transportation in the United States, the secretary of transportation in the federal government is somebody who before he was appointed head of transportation was the mayor of Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, Ohio, I'm pretty certain is not even in the top 50 population of cities in the United States. So now again, if you're an adversary trying to figure out who's gonna be running the United States four, five, six, ten 10 years from now, you have to start looking at who are the mayors of towns, uh, who are members of the state legislature, who are people in the local county and state offices who are going to rise to be uh, the big national leaders. And finally, the uh, uh, one major reason, um, and people have been saying this for years, uh, is it's cheap and easy. Uh, uh, David Sanger, who covers intelligence for the New York Times, he wrote a book called The Perfect Weapon. He says that cyber attacking, cyber attacks are the perfect weapon. They are inexpensive and effective. And uh, uh, Joe, I think you said it was the most 
uh, uh, the most uneven um, uh, 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 warfare in the history of the human race, that somebody with a small budget can go after the biggest countries in the world and uh, have some success. Now, OPM, uh, that's the uh, US Office of Personnel Management in uh, Washington, DC. Um, and they collect the personnel records of everybody, not only everybody in the federal government, everybody who applies for a job in the federal government. They have all that information. Well, the Chinese went after that database. They scooped it all up. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think they were after a couple of thousand people. The database had tens of millions of people. And again, because the technology is so cheap and easy, they just took it all. Said, okay, we're gonna get everybody's personal records. And then back in China, we can take our time and go through them and see who's of interest. But now they've got the personal records of everybody in the US government and everybody who has applied for a job in the US government. So uh, uh, our, uh, one of our lead presenter at cybersecurity likes to say, you know, everyone is a target, even you, and that has to be your starting point, that you are a target, whether or not uh, uh, you know it, and especially if you don't know it. I've talked about Russia hitting schools. Um, the, um, uh, one of the secretaries of state uh, in the United States, the secretary of state uh, is the person in the state who, in most cases, is the person running elections. And so uh, one of the secretaries of state, and, uh, uh, and we work with almost all of them, uh, said in one of our workshops, why bothering to lock your front door at night? There are thieves out there, but the really good ones, they know how to pick the lock. So why bother to lock your door? What you really want to do is to have a lock that's good enough. So yes, the thief could pick the lock if he or she took the time, but you want to make it just difficult enough so the thief will go someplace else. That's really what you're trying to do in cybersecurity because you versus the Russian experts in St. Petersburg, Russia, or the experts in China, you're going to lose. But you just want to make it difficult enough for them so they'll go someplace else. How do we try to come prepare people for combating these threats? We employ multiple disciplines. As I said, we have six different uh, uh, expertise, sets of expertise represented and also we go to all 50 states. Until March of 2020, we could travel. Uh, from March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, uh, we did each state, state by state, uh, um, by Zoom. Uh, and then last year in 2021, we didn't have major elections in the US. Um, and this year, again, we did regional uh, uh, programs. But again, making certain that each of the states in the United States was represented both in their election offices and in their major campaigns. Um, this is uh, Kim Wyman, who is the new, uh, well, relatively new, she was appointed uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, she is the point person in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security on, uh, she's called the Election Security Lead. And um, in our first workshop this year, she said that uh, attacks uh, on, cyber attacks on U.S. elections would be wider and more pervasive. Um, and again, just because more people are doing it and, it's, and people are discovering how easy it is. Now, here's a classic example of how adversaries take advantage. Uh, and I'll just back in just a moment. We talk about Russia and China again, because you can, you can defend against them. You can defend against amateurs trying to do it. You can defend against ransomware. Um, so I use a lot of examples from Russia and China. Um, here's a story from late summer. Um, that uh, uh, hackers linked to China are attacking human rights groups. And look at the, how they're doing it. They take advantage of a widespread and persistent failure to implement even basic cybersecurity defenses. So, okay, we thought we would be talking about expertise and uh, high level computer science. No, we were told by people working in uh, state, local and presidential campaigns no, begin with the very basic cybersecurity defenses. So, okay, what are the most common attack vectors? Passwords. You don't want to, first of all, you don't want to use a word, an English language word or a word in other languages. Why? Because our adversaries have a list of those. We call it a dictionary. And they have software to run every word in the dictionary in English and other languages through very quickly to test them, to see if 
you're using one of those words as a password. Once they're, once they're in, if you're using a word as a password, they're in, you're in they're into your system. Very simple, oh, and, and don't share your password with other sites. If you use the same word for your email uh, and for um, uh, playing video games, not a good idea because they can get lists of the passwords associated with the users for certain types of, uh, uh, of software. Then what they'll do is say, okay, I've got Adam Powell's password for Yahoo. Let's try, try it for all the other accounts we know he has. Let's try it for his bank account. If I'm using the same password for my bank account, they're in. Um, Multi-factor authentication. Um, when you log in, does somebody call you on your cell phone? To send you a text message to verify that it's really you logging in. Uh, that's a simple way of doing it. They're more uh, difficult uh, and sophisticated ways. Uh, at USC, we actually have these little tokens that we use, which are um, uh, quite difficult to hack. Um, social engineering. The adversary wants you to panic. And so what they'll do is send you, this is a common one, send you a message saying, your account has just been hacked. You need to change your password right now because now people in Russia have your password. You say, oh my goodness, I gotta change my password. Well, what do they do? They have a little, uh, little button there saying, change password. They want you to click on that button and that will take you to something that looks like your bank account or your email account or whatever. And again, it says, enter password and new password. Well, guess what? They didn't have your password before, but if you fall for that, uh, uh, that approach, and you click on it, and then put in your password. Now they've got your password, and now they'll use it um, and go after uh, your accounts. Unprotected data on uh, uh, phones, laptops. Now the good news is that uh, data encryption is not only common; it's almost certainly on anything you've bought recently, anything you've bought in the last probably four or five years. But is it turned on? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah, it's very simple to turn on, but get you, you have to get your IT people usually to help you. So what we do is we try to do three things well. We don't have all day with people uh, we're doing these sessions mostly by Zoom. And uh, in Zoom, you don't have more than about an hour and a half, two hours at the most. So do three things well and share the best practices that we can find around the states, uh, around the different US states, and also around the world. Um, so here are our three subjects, cyber safety and cybersecurity. Then we do disinformation and misinformation. And you're going to uh, see uh, 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 from Los Angeles where it's six in the morning. So she's gotten up early, our uh, lead expert on disinformation. And then finally, resilience and uh, crisis response. What happens uh, first? How do you prepare for the bad thing to happen to you successfully? And then if the bad thing has happened to you, what do you do? Um, and, and some of it's very simple. One of the lessons from the Ukraine is what you do is you pull the plug out of the back of your computer because then you've broken the connection, uh, which is how they keep the lights on in Ukraine when Russia attacks. Um, we have state university partners across the United States. We have media partners across the United States and a national media, media partner, the Associated Press. Um, state universities around the US, including some in locations you would not expect uh, have great cybersecurity expertise and are teaching it to large numbers of students because we have a huge shortage in the US and worldwide in expertise in uh, cybersecurity. One of the biggest is in South Dakota, rural state, low population. They have an entire college of cybersecurity. Um, so uh, identifying partners around the country is uh, essential. Now let's get to the first of uh, my colleagues who's going to uh, uh, share some insights with you. And so Maurice Turner, he's an election security analyst with our project. Um, he has been the uh, assistant to the director of the US Federal Election Assistance Commission. He's been in private industry. He served on Capitol Hill in cybersecurity. And so uh, let's uh, now go to Washington DC and uh, my colleague, uh, Maurice Turner. Do I need to do that from here? Hello, everyone. How are you? My name is Maurice Turner. And as Adam said, I've been involved in election security for a number of years, and I'm excited to talk to you today about some free 
and low-cost resources that you will be able to use wherever you are. I'd like to start with this first slide, which is the Telework Best Practices. It's made by the US federal government. And even though it was produced a couple of years ago in response to more folks working remotely and response to the pandemic, these tools and pieces of information are still applicable today. It gets right at the heart of the issue, which is to understand that there are different types of people who are working remotely and they need different types of information in order to stay cyber safe. You have your executive leaders, your teleworkers, and your IT staff. Each of these different groups have a different role to play in keeping the organization and its data secure. So it's important to identify who in the organization needs this different kind of approach to make sure that they are doing their part when it comes to cybersecurity. Next up is a conversation that was hosted by Google, and it was between private industry as well as US political parties. This roundtable discussion is important because it's a frank and honest discussion about the natural tension that campaigns face when they're trying to get the information out about their candidate while also making sure that their campaigns are secure. As Adam mentioned before, campaigns have been hacked in the past and they are certainly high priority targets for adversaries. So it's important to make sure that there's an open and frank discussion about the different ways that cybersecurity practices can be applied to campaigns while recognizing that campaigns by their nature rely on a lot of volunteers and getting the word out as quickly and easily as possible. Next, we have the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity Toolkit specifically for elections. This toolkit is something that's available to everyone regardless of where they are. It's one of the great things about the internet. All you have to do is go to the CISA website to find out what in particular you need to do if you're in elections to help protect those elections. It's geared for everyone that's in the field and it's relatively easy to use. The Election Assistance Commission also has security uh, preparedness best practices. These break down the administrative or the operational side of elections. Even though it's focused on helping to improve the operations for election officials, it's also a helpful resource for members in the community, as well as the media, who would like to have a better understanding of just how elections are run so they can get some insight into the day-to-day -day operations of elections. It doesn't just happen on election day. This preparation work takes months of effort ahead of time and continues even several weeks after election day to make sure that the votes are counted as they were cast and they were verified. The Global Cyber Alliance is a vendor agnostic standards-based toolkit for elections as well as for journalists. I like this in particular because it goes step by step to identify the different risks that groups like journalists might face and offers different ways they might be able to mitigate those risks with different resources or services. Again, this is free and available to anyone. As I mentioned before, campaigns rely heavily on volunteers. So in some ways, a campaign is like a small or even a medium-sized business. That's why this information from the Cyber Readiness Institute is applicable and can be very helpful. People are always going to be the most important link in the cybersecurity chain. That's why having open conversations with them to let them understand what their individual role is in cybersecurity will always pay off in the end. It's one of the most important investments that any organization can make, making sure that people understand that they play an important role in security and it's up to them to do their part. Google offers advanced protection for individuals who are at higher risk. Here are some examples of those individuals. The service that Google offers is available at no cost and provides that extra level of protection, whether it's additional detection and monitoring services, or it's things like the security key that Adam mentioned earlier. These are small but meaningful steps that help make it just that much more difficult for these more vulnerable individuals to have their accounts compromised and potentially taken over in a way that can either spread mis and disinformation 
or steal important data like critical files or lists. Microsoft offers a similar service called Account Guard. Again, this is their highest level of protection and it's available at no cost to those that are in the political space. This is helpful for folks that use Microsoft for email or document or other cloud-based services. Now, it seems that everyone is on social media, so it's natural for the conversations about politics and even campaigns to be happening there as well. So Facebook offers a higher level of protection, just as I talked about for Microsoft or for Google. It's called Facebook Protect. This locks down specific accounts for those more uh, those users who are at a higher risk of account takeover to make sure that no one is out there impersonating them or trying to spread some of that false information. You see here that Twitter offers a number of different ways to be prepared for elections. So much of the conversation, especially in the news media, happens on Twitter. So it's natural to see that as a place that can be a little bit more risky to be online, especially if you're an official in the government. So doing things that are helpful like labeling accounts or verifying accounts are additional steps that are taken to make sure that it's going to reduce the spread of mis- and disinformation. The last platform I'll talk about is TikTok. Some folks might think of it as an entertainment platform, but naturally wherever people are having conversations, some of those conversations are going to lead toward what's going on in life and ultimately politics. So TikTok has provided additional information about what they're doing to help prepare for the 2022 elections and beyond. I suggest you take a look at it and see if it makes sense to be on the platform. I always advocate for being where the people are having the conversation because you never know what people are saying and who's trying to influence them. One of the most important tips I can offer you is to make sure that your mobile platforms are as secure as possible. I'm sure everyone who's been using their Google or, or Apple device lately has seen so many updates coming through. I feel like every couple of weeks, I'm getting that notification. Well, besides new features, there are also important security patches. Some of these patches are so new that they've actually been exploited before they can be fixed. So I recommend turning on those automatic updates and making sure that you check your operating system to see if there are additional security features like lockdown modes or additional ways that you can protect your information on your mobile device. Our mobile devices hold so much information and are often that second level of security in terms of being able to log into other web-based or other accounts. So consider what you can do to make sure that your mobile device is as secure as possible and turn on that automatic update feature. These next couple of slides are going to be a list of resources. You don't have to worry about writing them all down now. These slides are going to be available so you can take your time and investigate these free tools and resources that you can use to help do some more research on uh, security and also learn a bit more about how you can really trust those sources of information when you're doing your research. As I close out the presentation, I wanna show you what the US federal policies um, that are coming down the pike will look like. These are all the ways that the federal government in the US has decided that it's going to protect critical infrastructure. Now, in the United States, elections infrastructure is considered critical infrastructure. So there's a higher level of scrutiny in terms of the expectations for everyone in the sector, but also higher level expectations that those that are securing the sector are coordinating their efforts. Given that the country is so large, it's understandable that there's gonna be extra layers of bureaucracy and more complexity. So it makes it even more critical that there is a coordinating function that happens at least at the higher level to help steer resources in the right direction and make sure that the floor for security is high enough that no one looks like an easy target regardless of where they are. And with that, I'll say thank you. And I want to make sure that you know that we're all available for help. 
feel free to reach out and ask. And more importantly, I would hope that you're available too. We can do so much to help each other because this really is a global issue. And I believe that if we do work together, we can be secure together. Thank you. All of these resources available to you, uh, we'll have these here with uh, with our hosts, but also uh, they're also on our website uh, if you'd uh, uh, like to uh, uh, check it out. Um, one more free item that I was just uh, previewing for you from uh, Michael Coden at MIT. Uh, uh, very simple, uh, one pager, uh, some copies here. Again, uh, this is uh, something which he prepared for uh, 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 political and, uh, and election workers, but it really applies to uh, to all of us. Now, what are the stakes? I'm just going to uh, cover one more point, and then we'll go to Los Angeles for uh, uh, for a report on disinformation. What are the stakes on election night 2020 in the United States, November 2020? Um, the person here in this picture is uh, Gary Pruitt. He was the uh, president of the Associated Press um, and had been for uh, for some years. Uh, he said there were thousands of sophisticated attacks on uh, the Associated Press on election night. And he, he called them withering. He said it was the worst night of my life. Um, and uh, I, he, he's on our advisory board. And so I said, can you talk about this publicly? And he said, uh, yes. And in our first workshop um, uh, last year, 2019, he talked about it at some length and the videos on our website. Um, he said that they were definitely uh, many attacks the largest number of attacks came from Russia, some came from Pakistan, some came from other countries. They were trying to take down the Associated Press computer system. Why would they want to do that? Well, it turns out that in the United States, yes, we have decentralized voting, but on election night, we have centralized election uh, returns. They all come from the Associated Press computer system. So if they could take down the AP computer system, we would have, uh, election returns after they were certified by the state. So we wouldn't have them that night. We'd have them maybe a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later. But as Gary put it in our workshop, he said, imagine you're watching SABC uh, or you're uh, online uh, looking at the BBC or NHK Japan or RT in Russia. And they say, well, there's been an election in the United States today, but we're afraid we can't give you any election returns because there aren't any. Think of what that does to how you perceive not just the United States, but how you perceive democracy. And that's really the, the goal here. So I'm gonna introduce uh, uh, our second and final remote speaker simply, simply by noting that here's a phrase that uh, we heard from our US Department of Homeland Security. What's the ROI? What's the return on the investment if you are a bad actor, whether you're in, in Russia or if you're down the street? Well, it turns out changing votes is very difficult causing chaos, causing you not to believe the results of the election, that's cheaper and easier. And so that's why it's being done more and more. So foreign actors more likely to use information manipulation tactics. Uh, this is from a publication just a few weeks ago. And that brings us to our second remote speaker, uh, my colleague, Sarah Mojarad, who is uh, in Los Angeles, where my goodness, uh, thank you for getting up early, Sarah. It's six in the morning there. Uh, she is our uh, lead person on uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation on malinformation. Uh, she's in the School of uh, Engineering at USC. So uh, let me uh, let you switch now to Los Angeles and uh, Sarah Motora. Thank you, Adam. And good afternoon to everyone. Just gonna pull up my slides and we can get started. Okay, so for today, I'm going to cover a few topics. First, I'm going to define disinformation and misinformation. Next, I'm going to describe why social media, social media users spread false information. And I'll close this afternoon with some tips on how to identify inaccuracies on social media. So first, I define disinformation as false information that is specifically manufactured to appear credible, deceive and confuse, and distort facts. So in 2016, we saw a piece of disinformation that was circulating that suggested actor Bill Murray was running for president. 
this is that piece of disinformation. Let's quickly break down why this is persuasive. First, we see here that it's allegedly from a trusted news outlet, NBC. Next, take a look at this photo. It's a professional image, and we would assume that a news outlet like NBC would have someone on staff to produce this. Now look at the title of this article. It says, I'm running for president in 2016, so it's as if they received Bill Murray's quote. Finally, there's an author associated with this piece, and it's been tagged as news. We also saw disinformation during the recent Kenya election, and this was all over social media. So here we see, after the results were announced, that this image and tweet appeared, and it says, calls for mass protests on Thursday. However, take a look at this image. It's not actually a recent photo. In fact, it was published in 2017 related to a different incident in Kenya. Disinformation often is per very persuasive as we saw with these two examples, but you can look for red flags. First, the information is typically unverifiable. So there's no other news outlet that's covering this. And it's also from an unknown actor an unknown author, whether it be an unfamiliar journalist or an anonymous social media user. And finally, disinformation typically elicits strong emotions such as fear or outrage. Let's now talk about misinformation. I define this as false information that is shared with no motive or deliberate attempt to mislead people. And people will share it because it aligns with their own attitudes, beliefs, and political leanings. If we return to this example with Bill Murray, what we saw on social media is that people were creating unique hashtags and this link was shared everywhere. And Adam spoke about uh, cybersecurity. So as a social media user, you wanna be very careful with the information that you're clicking. Now, this is allegedly from a trusted news outlet, ABC News, but we know that's not the case because .com .co is an indication that this is not actually from ABC's domain. So very quickly, this article was debunked. But the problem with disinformation is that once it's debunked, it doesn't just disappear from the internet. So six months later, we saw this article resurface. And as we see here with this Facebook post, this person has says, if this is real, he's got my vote. So if you're ever in doubt of the legitimacy of a piece of information you are viewing on social media, make sure you don't share it. Let's turn to a little bit of data. In 2021, Pew Research Center polled Americans to see how they're getting news. And of the percentage of people who regularly get their news there, these are the platforms that they access for news. Let's discuss South Africa briefly. Reuters, University, Reuters Institute and the University of Oxford looked at the sources of news in South Africa from 2019 to 2021. And in their research, they found that 75% of South African speakers are in, 75 of English speakers in South Africa get their news on social media. 91% of people are accessing their news online so compare this to the 32% of people who are receiving their news in print. Things have changed. So unrestricted access to information, we are afforded this thanks to the speed and connectivity of the internet. And I love using these two photos to really show this. On the left, we see the New York subway in the 1940s. Everyone has a newspaper in their hand. Flash forward and we see what's changed, tablets. But this level of access doesn't mean accuracy. So we all need to do our part to ensure that we are accessing and sharing credible information. So why does misinformation spread? Let's focus on a couple of concepts, echo chambers and confirmation bias. There's been a lot of research into echo chambers. And recently the study was published in 2021 where researchers looked at four different platforms and 100 million pieces of content. What they found was that when polarization is high, misinformation spreads quickly. Confirmation bias is this tendency to believe information that aligns with our own personal beliefs and worldviews. So this comic, oh, excuse me. So um, whenever you see viral political videos and photos on social media, few questions to ask. 
who, what, where, when, and why. And this is especially true for breaking news, and especially when it's rated, it's related to political figures and election results. Wait until the information has been vetted and verified by a trustworthy source. So first draft came up with this concept for social media users called Think Sheep. Look at the source. Is it reliable? Check out the history on the account. Is there an agenda associated with it? What evidence is being used to support the claims? Also check in with yourself. Are you feeling fear and emotion, uh, fear and outrage? Remember that this could be an indication of disinformation and take a look at how pictures are being used. As we saw with the example with Bill Murray, that was very persuasive because of that photo. So if you see misinformation and disinformation on social media, first and foremost, don't share it. Disengage from these online communities where it's being shared and use those flagging and reporting features that social media has in order to um, tag it and make sure the platforms are aware of it. And finally, you can also report the content directly to the campaign or political party. So thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, to summarize my points, misinformation and disinformation have offline impact. Fake posts are persuasive and they often play on our emotions. And if you're sharing unverified information on social media, know that you could be contributing to the spread of misinformation. Thank you. Uh, Adam, I wonder if you have uh, any final comments before we go to the responses. Uh, I really was going to uh, uh, say at this point, we want to um, do what we always encourage our colleagues in diplomacy to do, which is to start to listen. So, Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was quite an informative uh, uh, presentation, series of presentations. I think uh, without further ado, we'll go to the responses from our panelists here. Uh, noting that we have Mr. Lubisi uh, Mapanga from uh, the Independent Electoral Commission who will be joining us. Uh, we'll start with Tandi, uh, your response, because I think Tandi has also requested at some point she might want to uh, leave. But let's start with you, your observations, comments. We'll then move on to Professor Kadegala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to be here having these conversations um, and, and learning from one another. Um, I am interested, though, uh, to know if South Africa was ranked in the, the cybersecurity countries. And, and if we were, what, what number? Do we have that information? Okay, great. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. It's, it's interesting. So I'm from an organization called Media Monitoring Africa. And you, you might be wondering why on earth we, we're getting involved in this conversation and, and why I'm responding. One of the, the, the critical areas of work that we, we focus on is disinformation and elections but with the added approach of ensuring that we have a credible, accurate and free media um, that journalists are able to, to operate in an election period and report um, and provide information that is, that is necessary. We were started as an organization in 1993 in the lead up to our first democratic elections to monitor and analyze the coverage of our elections. And since then we've grown into an organization that um, that applies and implements a number of different projects and programs to to work towards con contributing to a, a, a free media that is able to hold powerful accountable and and in that is is ensuring that we we mitigate and combat um, this information. I know the the previous uh, presentation touched a, a lot on what is disinformation, what is misinformation, and, and some solutions to, to combating it. Um, and I think, I think firstly to say that I think we, we in South Africa are in a particularly unique position 
because we are having to deal with a, a, a multi-faceted approach to to an election period in that we we have to take into consideration the digital environment that we find ourselves in um, and and with that the very serious cybersecurity issues that come along with it but we're also dealing with a large percentage of our population um, still offline and and so it's it's being able to adopt different strategies where you you provide solutions and you provide mechanisms in place for those who are online who are getting their um their their information or social media platforms and the, the statistic that was um presented earlier is, in, is interesting the the english speak, uh, speaking population um and the percentage getting news from different platforms that's a tiny percentage of our population we know that one of our our biggest audiences is still um, that of our public broadcaster, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, SABC. And we still broadcast in analog television segments. And so it's, it's how we, we sort of apply the strategies that we've, um, that we've learned to a, an offline, or a, I want to call it a semi-online um, platform. We, we're dealing with very different um, I suppose channels of potential missing disinformation and that WhatsApp is also one of the biggest mediums where we see the spread of disinformation and misinformation. So just going back to, to sort of why we, we do this work um, and how it's relevant to, to elections and disinformation. One of the biggest threats to democracy is that of a non-functional or not free media um, media system. The role of journalists is is just as important today as it was hundreds, thousands of years ago when you had your first election thing. Like I really enjoyed that that um, piece of information, <laughs> um, and it it's it just goes to well, it it's just reiterates the point that. Um, Propaganda, disinformation, misinformation, um, uh, attacking those who hold powerful accountable isn't something new. We've just changed the methods and it's become easier and easier uh, over the years. And that's something that we are dealing with today. What we as MMA have, have done over the last few years, um, we, we realized that mitigating or combating disinformation during an, during an election period um, is is something that needs a, a multi-pronged approach it's it's not easy to identify disinformation it's not easy for experts to identify disinformation never mind an ordinary person who, who's just scrolling through their twitter timeline and we needed a solution for this uh, we partnered with the IEC, we'll hear from the IEC in a few minutes, partnered with the IEC and built a platform called uh, The Real 411, where ordinary people can submit complaints of disinformation um, to the system. We, we did this because we know that the, the different social media platforms regulate content differently in different jurisdictions. Um, the way we need it regulated here is not the same way that it needs to be regulated in the States, and it's not the same way it needs to be regulated in, in many other countries. Um, and that poses a challenge. Um, we, we, we have to strike that balance between regulating content online and promoting freedom of expression online. And, and it's a very gray area where, where those two, uh, two challenges meet. Um, and so, yes, there are ways that you can sort of safeguard yourself with um, the, dealing with this information. But what we have found works um, in, in our context is enabling people to take action against, um, against the content. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention was um, the way we define disinformation um, in our context is is very similar to the previous definition that we we heard, but we go further to to talk about 
intention to cause public harm. Um, so it's manipulated content, um, false information, manipulated content that's disseminated with the intention to cause public harm. And for us, that's what sets it apart from, from misinformation, um, which we then have, have similar definitions for. We saw disinformation um, being spread and used in our 2019 elections. But what, what's really interesting is that in 2019, what we saw was simple strategies to cause doubt in the electoral system. And that's, as, as we've heard um, in the previous presentations, that's all that is needed to manipulate voters into creating doubt, creating mistrust in our, in our um, public institutions, and um, just discouraging people from actually voting. It's already something to, to get up, to go vote, to, to take the time to do that. And, and when you have conflicting messaging, making that even harder, you're going to have even lower voter turnouts. And without the voters, um, the democratic project is, is a failure as it is. So, oh, the, the, I wanted to, to touch on some examples quickly. Um, I know I've only got a few more minutes, but the, the, we had some, some ridiculous disinformation um, uh, making the rounds during our election periods. 2021, we had our local elections. 2019 was our national elections. And this plat we, we had our platform up and running for, for both. Um, one of the classic strategies was, as I mentioned, to, to cause doubt in the voting process um, and voting logistics. We had messaging and content going around stating that voting was spread over a number of days instead of one particular day. And if you were voting for a particular party, you needed to go vote on a particular day. And people took it seriously. People were asking questions, were sending messages to the IEC about what is actually going on. When do they go vote? Um, and, and that's a, a classic example of, of how, how threatening a very easy piece of content can be to, to an election period. Um, we, what we know as well, and what's particularly important to our content is that voting day is not just the election, or the election period is not just voting day. Um, it's, it's, it's ongoing. We know in South Africa, although our national elections are only in 2024, we are already campaigning. Um, well, our political parties are already campaigning. We're already gearing up for voting day um, in 2024. Disinformation is already starting to do the rounds. So, so it's about how we deal with this outside of the election period. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of um, organizations doing work with, within an election period, but it needs to extend outside of that. We also need to, to grow our understanding of disinformation to that of content that is um, that that intersects between other online harms. So often with this information you'll find racist speech, you'll find hate speech, you'll find xenophobic content, um, harassment, and it, it's sort of all intertwined into into the concept of, of online harms. So for us, we focus on how we ensure that our journalists and our media are, are able to operate um, during an election period and outside of an election period without the intimidation and harassment that, that go along with, with this information. Um, so I think that, that if there's one takeaway from, from our response is that it's, it's critical that these interventions and that these initiatives also target ensuring that journalists are equipped with tools and with um, techniques to, to ensure that they are too uh, safeguarded from, from cyber attacks, from disinformation. But not just that, that we also ensure that our, our media environment is um, safeguarded and, and that we build trust and credibility in our media. We know that people are getting 
their, their content from a number of different platforms, we know that the media environment is changing. Um, we know that the way people interact with information is changing, but it's, it's ever more critical that we, we ensure that, that our media is, is safeguarded. Um, and I think for, for, for me, I will stop there. Um, thank you. Those comments? And I think move straight away to Professor Kadiagala. Uh, uh, I'll now request Professor Kadiagala to kind of also kind of summarize. We we kind of we got, we, and, and then after that we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, the audience, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I think Bob invited me here as a real outsider. Uh, because I'm not working on these issues uh, of cyber security, or, but I've done some work on elections. Uh, so I thought I would just uh, briefly maybe reflect on, on what I want to call the big, uh, the broader African experiences. Uh, I think cyber security is an emerging issue, it's a global issue, it's an African issue, uh, and, and we have to take interest in in that, in that issue because uh, it, it confronts us every day. Having said that, uh, I think the links between uh, elections and cybersecurity are still fairly tenuous for most of our countries. And uh, explanations are fairly simple. One is that uh, we have very rudimentary uh, electoral infrastructures in, uh, in most of our countries. Uh, and I think we are talking about South Africa, maybe a few other countries, and those are exceptions. Uh, voting is still very much manual in our country. Uh, but I like the Greek story too on, on the manual part because in fact, it was very easy for regimes to manipulate elections when we had uh, the old systems. Uh, but I'll also say the same thing about uh, the, the digital era where uh, the bulk of, uh, uh, of the electoral malfeasance are actually caused by regimes, ruling parties that don't want to give up power. And that's, that's, that's the, the broader African experience where you don't really have free elections and uh, that you have very uncompetitive opposition parties uh, trying to, to compete against very dominant parties. So I think the, 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 the fact that uh, the electoral infrastructure is rudimentary and these systems are new uh, makes Africa is essentially unique in that, in that link between elections and cybersecurity. But I think the second point that I wanted to make is that uh, there is relatively limited external influence. Uh, I think there are some debates about Russia or China maybe may getting into the electoral arena in some African countries, but that has not actually been as widespread. Uh, so that component makes Africa very different uh, in, in, in that respect. So election insecurities therefore emanate from what I'm calling local sources. So the technologies are enabling, uh, as I said, most notably ruling parties uh, to use them very effectively, even for misinformation and disinformation. It is not a wide, the, the level, the, the playing field is not level, uh, even in the digital arena. So it makes it a fairly unique. Who manipulates the election? Who misinforms? Is, is for the most part, I think, in our, in our cases, people who want to remain in power. Let me just come briefly to the Kenyan case because it's been raised. Uh, and Kenya comes very close to, I think, the link between cybersecurity and the election. And I just wanted to give the example of the 2013 election. Uh, when our British organization, Cambridge Analytica, was involved, was invited, in fact, by uh, 
uh, the Kenyatta arm of, uh, of, 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 of the political equations, in fact, rigged the 2013 elections. And they did that electronically. Uh, so that remains, I think, in the annals of African elections, one of the closest that will come to what you are describing as, a, as an emerging issue. And, and very recently, the 2021 elections, uh, the Ruto regime, no, the Ruto government, the Ruto, the Ruto party, and uh, there, there are stories about uh, hiring Venezuelans who came in, in fact, to manipulate the electoral process. Uh, again, using all these technologies and so on. So Kenya has provided good lessons, but I don't even know how to uh, understand those lessons. Uh, because they are still tilted to some incumbent trying to manipulate the electoral process. Uh, so it, 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 it brings in an, a, very, a very different issue uh, on uh, who actually is doing, uh, uh, who, who is responsible for these cyber crimes. Is it the regimes or is it those people out there who are probably interested in uh, in a, in a fair and free election. So the problem is that we don't have free and fair elections. Uh, and therefore the losers are uh, digitally or not would be people who probably were not, uh, don't have the power. What I wanted to raise therefore for the future, I think as we think about these issues going forward, uh, that elect, uh, cyber crime and Elections are going to emerge as a big issue in Africa uh, as we have more elections, particularly as we have more competitive elections. And of course, the technologies are there. So it's very easy for, for these countries to begin to go into that uh, dynamic of using the, elect uh, the, the electronic systems to manipulate elections in future. And that has begun. But the second issue I think we should be thinking about in future is who are the real enemies of elections? Uh, and I'm not just talking about domestically. I'm also talking about who are the global actors who probably have no, no stake in elections. Uh, because the technologies are simply the tools uh, to advance their objectives. So I think we need to do more in identifying uh, the local and international actors probably have no stake, who have no stakes in democracy. And then we can then see how we deal with the very instrumentalities, the tools they use uh, to manipulate elections. Coming back to the Kenyan, I think this has come up also in the discussion. The Twitter wars, I think to me are the biggest threat <laughs> Uh, to, to African democracies in terms of just the destabilization of the political marketplace. Uh, and, and this is part of this information, but I don't know how uh, we, uh, I, I, I don't know who on which side in the Twitter wars, for instance, in the Kenyan context, managed to triumph. Uh, but again, I think research will show uh, that this, uh, large scale manipulation even on Twitter really are an outcome of dominant parties, or dominant groups who are actually using these instruments to in fact change the electoral outcome. So those are just my two cents. Thank you, Professor Kadegala. A round of applause for him. No, no just wait. Yeah. I, I think at this point, I would like to request our colleague Tandy uh, to give us space so that we can have Lubisi. Uh, it, as you can see, our podium is a bit limited. So it's, and we needed uh, Mr. Lubisi to be in the podium for the recording and so forth. Uh, Mr. Lubisi Mapanga is the uh, CIO, Chief Information uh, officer at the Independent Electoral Commission of South Africa. Uh, so your responses, uh, you can also attempt to summarize 
and then we'll go to audience engagement as we go towards closure. We'll also give an opportunity to Mr. Paul to make his final comments on the basis of those responses and audience questions. Thank you very much and most welcome. Okay, thank you and good afternoon. Um, I'm coming from the Eastern Commission. Coming from the Director of Commission of South Africa, we are in ejection management. So, our focus is much more focused on ejection management, post ejection management, post process. Okay. We look at the national picture, but we don't have responsibility in all the including some of those that impact on elections. And as an election management bureau, but also taking into account the South African constitutional framework, we are an election management body with the responsibility for delivering election in a centralized, managed context. And like the US, where things are decentralized, election management is all the way to counties. And even the rules vary from county to county in terms of the way they process the same election. What is the presidential elections? They've got the local variations that impact on how they did it. But in our case, we are the only institution responsible for election in the country. So we have centralized all the processes. And uh, so we can protect to the extent possible most of these processes, especially those that are computerized and facilitated through technology. And we have got quite an elaborate process. We have uh, built the tools and application system to support the entire value chain from delimitation to party registration to candidate nomination to elections, even some of our outreach and voter education processes. We have got systems and tools that facilitate those processes. And uh, we and all those systems are tightly protected through a whole range of technologies that are available in the market. We do collaborate with other state entities, the national state security agencies, the security structures of government, including the military and police and intelligence agencies. Especially when we prepare for elections, we do attend joint meetings where, where we look, they look at security across the whole country and uh, issues of cybersecurity do pop up because they are also monitoring at, at, at that level. But they run with those processes at the national level from the specific agencies with the mandate at that level. Like Tandy has indicated, we do part, I mean, uh, engage, we do have a joint uh, sort of partnership with uh, Media Monitoring Africa to to deal with this information in particular. We have a collaboration where we, where we use their website, uh, real411.org, where people can uh, check validity of information and can also submit complaints and things to be followed up. And we use that tool to collect any complaints or any observation around the country and it gets filtered through a process where to, 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 to the extent that should it be necessary, the Electoral Commission will have to reflect on it and make a decision in terms of how it impacts on the elections, how it distort processes and affect the freeness and fairness of elections. 
And in that collaboration, we actually bring in the platforms themselves, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and you mentioned them. They, they do come in, they become part of, part of the, the consultation process, even the, the training for political parties to prepare themselves, to protect their own information, to protect their own images on the social media and on the online platform. And it has worked very well for us in terms of spreading that. At that level, like all other areas, we see cybersecurity as a collaborative effort across the whole spectrum, across the whole nation. At the detailed internal levels, I mean, we have put in place all the necessary tools. And our strategy is really focusing on defensive and, uh, and security in depth. And we build all those even into our application design, application development, and how we structure the, 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 our systems and the infrastructure that supports that. We've built multi-layer security structures and filterings and firewalls, DDoS mitigations internally at the perimeter and upstream where we use uh, cloud services like Cloudflare to, to do upstream DDoS mitigation and, 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 and filtering. So we build those layers in recognition of the, the fact that the threat is very big and very wide. Whereas most uh, uh, scholars, and especially American scholars, will always report about China and Russia, with North, North Korea and those. We see the threat across the whole world. And uh, especially coming, being part of the third world, coming from regime change experiences, we, we look at everything holistically. We don't uh, compartmentalize issues. From many years ago, I mean, I remember I think somewhere in the early 2000, reading an article by a guy, I don't know if I remember what the name was, Alberto. He, he, they wrote a long article about his experience of influencing the, the outcome of elections in Colombia. And it was soon after the elections were announced and he, he was, they were writing about what he was doing. As everybody was celebrating, he was busy trying to clear up his footprints across the whole of Latin America too, so that uh, his role in the outcome is not impacted. And we have seen Cambridge Analytica coming in. That's the first time we saw technology starting to impact on US election or being acknowledged as impacting on US elections. We have always accepted on our side that uh, we, we, we are in between everybody in the world and attack can come from anywhere. When you look at our monitoring, I mean, the tools that we use to monitor, to check where the attacks comes from, where the attempts to inject, uh, 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 dangerous uh, tools and whatever, they come across the top around the world. And I can say, while Russia, because it's business for them and they sell business to hack others, <coughs> you will, it will be amongst the, the top, but they will be, it, it, goes, it goes up and down from time to time. Everybody's there, the US, uh, Brazil and uh, India, you mentioned them, that is, are these state actors? We don't know. They might be ordinary criminals who are either working for somebody, maybe my next door neighbor, or who are trying to find a business opportunity for themselves. As it was indicated, it's easy and cheap 
because they they can throw this tool their their attack tools into the wild web and leave it there for years. It keeps on hitting everything. So I can show the graphs on my my security monitoring at all the different levels. You see it going up and down. There will be times when something national is announced or a major national political debate pops up, then you will see the the graphs goes up in terms of the number of instantaneous things coming in. But they are there full time. You can't relax. They're 24 hours a day, 365 days. And because they're easy, they're cheap, they just throw bots all the time. And those bots keep on replicating themselves. And uh, if and I don't know even whether they, they, they do more monitor themselves to say how many of them are in the space. Because you see them going up and down from time to time, but it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Key amongst our strategies, over and above the technology things that we built into, into the system is collaboration and is transparency of election processes. We believe one of the biggest protection of our election is transparency of the process. And uh, we engage the political parties, we engage NGOs in the election management process. They know every step, they get engaged in all the steps. The information is made public at all times <clears throat> so that even if we miss a step ourselves, the other stakeholders will pick up that there is an error. There is somebody who has filtered. I mean, fiddle will do that thing. And fortunately for now, while we have automated all the processes, the election or the voting process is still manual, which allows a lot of transparency to happen. And it allows the political parties, the candidates who are contesting the elections and all stakeholders to, to work with us, to watch the actual voting, who voted, did where and when. We make the voters all available. And the law has allowed us to, 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 to disclose the information. And uh, we exempted from uh, OPL, or the equivalent of GDPR or CD, I mean, DPD in the US, okay, we are exempted when it comes to sharing the voters role so that our stakeholders can know who's voting, who will be voting at a particular point and how many are they. And when we look at the results and then when they see people voting, they can see that. And even in the counting and collecting of the results, they are there, they are observing the process. After, after counting at the voting station, the political parties will take a copy of the results. And now with cell phones, they will take the picture and send it to their own operations. By the time as an election management body, we collate the information. The parties and the candidates have collected it long before. They're just waiting to confirm that there are not distortions. And uh, so in short, I would say, Transparency is a highly critical element of our attempt to protect, especially elections, but to, to, to protect the whole process. Yeah, I think on a high level, I would say that I would look at that. There are other processes of auditing the results, auditing our systems, auditing the security of our infrastructure and all those that we have built into this environment as a way of protecting election management processes. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can appreciate those comments. And uh, even as I'm itching to throw in my own questions, I'm uh, fully aware that we've just slightly gone over time. And uh, so I think we can entertain a couple of uh, questions. I know it will have been great to have Adam respond to the responses, but uh, in the circumstances, I think uh, uh, we'll uh, go to the two or three questions. We haven't forgotten our colleagues who are 
joining us uh, virtually. We'll display the questions at some point. But if you have a question or comment, make it short um, uh, and then uh, direct it to any specific person. Then we'll uh, also entertain a couple of those from our virtual audiences. And I think all the gentlemen now, I think Tandy left from the podium can respond to those. Uh, if you raise your hand, I'll just come to you. Okay, we have the first one. I think also introduce yourself in a sentence. Let's make it short in the interest of time. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, my, my name is Johannes Sokololo, um, doctoral candidate at the University of Johannesburg. So my question will be directed to Adam Clayton. I'm, I'm just thinking about uh, overall in terms of uh, capitalism surveillance or surveillance capitalism, because uh, as these big companies chase data from uh, citizens, that data become available to whoever. And as you've seen through Cambridge Analytica, that data can now be used to influence elections. So it seems like there's a trade-off between capitalism and the risk of uh, elections. Have, uh, what has America thought about that in terms of securing elections, in terms of minimizing the amount of data that the companies seek from citizens? Because that data then allows uh, adversaries to know how to target that particular person. If I like uh, a comment by the ANC here at home, obviously then those who are monitoring ANC will know that I'm a good target for them. So they can specialize or design a particular uh, message that will resonate with me. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll go to the next question. There's been quite a, a, a few debates on uh, these uh, tech companies themselves. Uh, is our data safe with them? Uh, uh, I think Adam will respond to that. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon to the panel and to the floor at large. My name is Langeli Lemtembu. I'm a final year medical student um, here at Bits. Um, I actually had two questions, um, but I'll just keep it at one for the sake of time. Um, my question is directed at Mr. Adam Powell, and it's regarding the point you made about the identification of um, promising future leaders. And you made a point, one example, about how things are done back at home where they identify, say, a mayor that's going to be a future promising leader at some point. And I just wanted to ask, do you have any knowledge about this happening at an even lower level, such as a student leader um, level? The reason I ask is because of my experience back here at home where as a former student leader myself, um, I've been privy to and at the receiving end of advances from uh, where the international actors or local actors, like say uh, the Chinese, where it seems like there's an interest of securing some sort of influence and they see maybe your future trajectory as someone that may have influence in the future. So I just wanted to find out about your knowledge about that, about it, happen it happening in universities at a student level. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Uh, I, I think we, we'll, you, you had an extra question, but you can approach any one of the speakers after the you know, we close for a, a very direct engagement. Who else? I think we can take perhaps one more uh, on this side. Uh, I think it looks like the delivery was uh, quite effective. I think there's one here. All right, thank you so much. I'm Joe Marks, a uh, former uh, freelance reporter here, former Washington Post reporter writing about cybersecurity. Um, I I'm wondering to what extent for the South Africans here, um, a thing that we talk about a lot in the United States is the way that um, discussions of uh, alleged or fabricated election vulnerabilities can really sort of depress faith in the electoral process, can um, create lots of fears about um, an illegitimate election process that may or may not be valid. We heard a lot of that from our former president. We've heard a lot of it from US politicians. To what extent has that bled outside of the United States and affected things over here? Is, is, is there more skepticism about the machinery of democracy in South Africa because of what we've seen in the United States than there would be otherwise? I suppose that is directed to 
Mr. Lubisi or to, yeah, yeah, sure, certainly. Uh, uh, to our panelists, do we want to weigh in on those? And then we do a last round one on, uh, our from our virtual audience. I think we can start uh, with uh, Mr. Clayton, then to Mr. Mapanga. I think, Prof, you escaped, you evaded uh, a bullet there, so that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to try to be short because I want to hear their uh, answers to, to the, the questions. Uh, also, uh, for um, uh, for both of you and for everyone, uh, I'll be here for a few minutes, so I know we're running a little out of time, but I know you had three questions. I'll be glad to um, answer all three. Um, the, if I understand correctly, um, the first question really related to voter information and privacy, uh, which is a major concern, and, and we ran into it in the US, it, it comes in, in different ways of how people can be identified and how people can be um, um, uh, approached in, in different ways. Um, one of the early problems that uh, we had in the US was um, uh, motor vehicle records, driver's license records, that uh, the state of California, for example, uh, put driver's license records online. So you could go and find you know, driver's license records and who they were, what kinds of things. Well, this, this very quickly became a uh, legal problem because people might target a certain individual. It could, could be a, uh, um, uh, someone who's having a disagreement with somebody and, and could uh, 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 go after them. Well, now we're seeing, um, uh, uh, as you say, in, in, uh, uh, in elections and in campaigns, the ability to identify not just who people are, but what they are. Parties, age, you mentioned age, very important uh, uh, in the US. Um, uh, the, uh, obviously it's in the interest of a lot of the political campaigns to have as much information as possible. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm not certain that uh, speaking as a voter, but I want my phone to be filled all, all, every, every hour of the day with messages based on uh, uh, people knowing uh, uh, a great deal about me, including uh, uh, not only my party registration, but who I might have voted for in the past. Uh, in the United States, we have something called, we call the Australian ballot, some of your information is supposed to be confidential. Well, they're, they're how, just how confidential can uh, voter information be kept? Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll actually just uh, look back at um, uh, one, per one person, uh, I think it was, uh, um, uh, yes, it was Gilbert, uh, who talked about uh, paper as a uh, rudimentary uh, form of uh, uh, elections. Well, in the United States, if anything, we're going back to paper. Uh, this is a longtime secretary of state of one state in New Hampshire, he said, you can't hack a pencil. So paper is, uh, even if a computer is involved, there'll be a paper backup. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it, you, you raise a very interesting question about privacy. Um, if, if I may, I'm gonna stop here. And I, I wish I can, I hope I can talk to you later about the three questions, because I really want to give time to my, uh, uh, my colleagues here on the panel. I'm not sure whether I understood you very well. Can you repeat the question? We raised more fears here in South Africa about the um, cyber insecurity of election systems. Right, as I said, uh, we have issues with elections in the US linked to digital technologies. Is it a concern here? So, I mean, people will always pick up experiences around the world and uh, try <coughs> and see whether we are not suffering from similar experiences. And, uh, and some also take some of those experiences to try and influence their fortunes in the election campaigning process. There has been suspicions of uh, campaigns similar to the, 
Cambridge Analytica type uh, processes that some parties uh, through their uh, their funders, the foreign funders and other processes are, are, are choose of maybe adopted those, but there hasn't been much evidence on that. What makes it a little bit more complex is because the, the voters law is accessible to the political parties. So they've got the names and addresses of, of the voters. What we don't give them is the, is the cell phone numbers or email addresses, but they can find those in the commercial space, a lot of it floating around. Some of it stolen from the credit unions and what have you by hackers, but uh, you do have those campaigns when you get to elections, targeted campaigns where a party calls you and says, and give you their message in terms of how you should vote or how you should be disposed to them as, as a contesting party in the elections. So yeah, South Africans are learning across the world and they are taking those lessons back home to, to try and influence their fortunes. I think we will, uh, I'll, I'll ask the audience to just excuse us. We'll try and wrap up this super fast in the next 10 minutes we should be done but we are now to go to our virtual audience uh, because we don't want them forgotten entirely uh, but even so we have a couple of questions but we'll try and uh, keep it to just a couple first one is there doesn't seem to be uh, sound oh no that was a technical issue i hear the audio okay uh oh no all those are technical I don't think we have any questions there at all from our, okay, okay, I'm not sure if the side, okay, no, all those are technical issues. So we do not have any questions from uh, our virtual audience. I think they, they were satisfied with listening in. Okay, so that being the case, I will uh, therefore turn it over to Adam, our keynote speaker, to give your concluding remarks. And then we'll, 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 we'll close it here with understanding that this is just the beginning of a conversation on comparing US elections, African elections. We have many elections coming up in Zimbabwe in, in next year, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, South Sudan, DRC. Many of these places are very interesting, Sudan. Um, and, and so we can continue this conversation. We look forward to partnering with the University of Southern California, but uh, over to you. Uh, concluding remarks, then we can take it from there. Thanks. I want to uh, uh, respond uh, by uh, ending where I began, which is uh, we hope to uh, listen and learn from your experience. We hope to share our experience. As I said, we'll be sharing the material which we uh, uh, which we presented. We also will be trying to uh, get back to answer additional questions that, that, uh, 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 that people have posed, uh, including some that uh, I saw on the screen. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and I, I think that everybody uh, should feel free. Uh, I, I know that uh, some of my colleagues don't like to do this, but everybody should feel free to contact me directly. Uh, you'll see it on my on my slide, but my email is quite public. AC Powell at USD.edu. Um, I'm delighted to take the time. If you take the time to contact me, I think it's only polite that I take the time to respond uh, fully to uh, to your concerns and interests and, and engage you in dialogue. And that's what I hope we are trying to do today. And I want to thank uh, 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 Bob and uh, all of the organizers of this session because of, it does provide a platform, I think, for all of us to uh, co collaborate on uh, some of these uh, problems which are very, very difficult uh, to solve, not just technologically, but uh, in terms of policy, in terms of law, and in terms of uh, democracy. So, Very much to our speakers, to Adam, Lubisi, Gilbert, and Tandi, uh, and for coming today and for really eye-opening remarks and and uh, um, 
yeah, some of it made me feel uncomfortable and how vulnerable uh, I probably, you know, am and how careless I am on my on my passwords and things. So uh, really uh, food for thought. Uh, so Saya would like to thank the uh, African Center for the Study of the US, uh, uh, Mr. Powell, Mr. Lapanga, Gilbert, and, and Tandy for uh, today. Uh, I know we've run a little bit late, so that's all I'm going to say. And I wish you a safe travels home. Thank you. A very last one for the audience here is if you want any of this material sent to you by email, I think you can contact us and, and we'll do that. But thank you very much. Yes.